Today we begin Flannery O'Connor's The Violent Barrett Away. And O'Connor is one of these uh, uh, writers from the 40s and 50s, 60s in the United States. Uh, so she's more contemporary than other, other novelists that we've read. Um, mostly a short story writer and also had a short life. I think she died in her mid-30s of lupus. Uh, lupus is one of these diseases that you see coming. Uh, you're diagnosed at an early age and you know that it's fatal and you won't live all that long. So she knew very early in her career <coughs> that she was going to have a short life and, uh, and you know, took advantage of it, wrote uh, several great novels, but she's really mostly known for her short stories, uh, of which there is a large collection of. Um, and uh, a very interesting and somewhat odd author. And uh, what that means hopefully will become a little clearer as we go through what's going on today. Today, the violent Barrett away. Now I want to uh, get some things clear about this novel, okay? And, and the, the first thing I want to make, get clear is the history of the particular characters in the novel. Because the relationship among them is not manifest. So we have main characters, old man Tarwater. He's the uncle, and Tarwater is the nephew. So think of your uncle, and then think of you as the nephew. Let's follow this relationship. Tarwater's mother <coughs> died in a car accident, and she gives birth to Tarwater as she expires. Tarwater has two known relatives, old man Tarwater, his uncle, and Raber, the school teacher. So think of it like this, old man Tarwater is two generations removed from Tarwater, but Raber is only one generation removed. Old man Tarwater is old enough to be his grandfather. Raber is old enough to be his father. And the relationship starts with Tarwater living with Raber. He starts living with Raber. But old man Tarwater has kidnapped Tarwater and brought him out to the woods to Powderhead to raise him properly in a Christian way. <coughs> okay, so in other words, Tarwater has lived with both these guys. Raber and his wife, the welfare woman, as she's called, whose name is Bernice Bishop, tried once after the kidnapping to come out and save Tarwater from the old man. But old man Tarwater brought out his gun, shot Raber, and chased them off. And they never came back. So old man Tarwater dies at the onset of this novel, at the onset of the action. And Raber has been told that he should bury his uncle and then take on the rest of his life, take over the job that old man Tarwater has set for him. So right away, and they should notice this right away, this is similar to housekeeping. The battle, or the, the book is a battle for one of the characters. It's a battle for Tarwater. A battle between old man Tarwater on the one hand, who wants to raise his nephew to be a prophet, and Raber, who wants to raise his nephew to trust in himself and to be all he can be. And let's just be clear about this, just to make sure we all understand. One would think that the fact that old man Tarwater expires at the novel's onset would make it difficult for him to win the battle over his nephew Tarwater and his future. 
Raber, in other words, seems to have the advantage in this battle, right? He's alive, which is an advantage, I guess. But we shall see that Tarwater nevertheless wins the battle, in a manner of speaking, but more on that later, okay? Tarwater, old man Tarwater wins the battle for Tarwater. And Rayburn loses. And that's kind of a summary of the novel, if you want to think of it like that. Now, many of you have no doubt read more of this novel. You've read the first part. None of these characters is particularly attractive or likable or sympathetic. That's by design. And, uh, and it's our job to figure out what each of these characters means, what each of the alternatives in the battle over Tarwater means, stands for. So we need to investigate Raber on the one hand and Old Man Tarwater on the other hand. These two characters are part of the novel's setting. Okay, they're the characters. One comes from the country. Old man Tarwater lives in the country, away from the city lights and the glitz. Rayburn lives in the city, where there are lights and where there is glitz. And there are different kinds of temptations. Those who live in the country in this novel seem less integrated into the American way of life and into the American way of thinking than those who live in the city. So the country folks of this novel, Old Man Tarwater, Buford Mumford, they're country folks. Backwards. On the other hand, we have characters that are clearly city folks. And they represent, I'm going to say, the established American way of life. Raber is a school teacher. And he is married to another representative of the state, the welfare woman. <coughs> Raber's father, whom we do not meet, was an insurance salesman. Meeks, who we'll also talk about today, is a traveling copper flu salesman that we meet in <coughs> chapter two. And they are all, Raber, Raber's wife, Raber's father, and Meeks, representatives of American morality. They live in the city. They're good Americans. So we have a battle between Old Man Tarwater and Raber. But that battle is a part of a larger battle between the mysterious, somewhat difficult to understand and appreciate Christian life, as seen in the country, and the secular, instrumental, rational life lived in the city. These are two alternative ways of viewing the world, and they are in conflict over the soul of Tarwater himself. So let's just summarize these characters, you know, once again, I think this is the attitude you have and should have while you read them. They're not altogether sympathetic characters. There's not a one that you read and say, yes, I'd like to be like him. Old Man Tarwater is obviously weird, strange, foreign. Raber is obviously manipulative. 
Carwater himself, aside from you know drowning somewhat retarded young children, is obviously not heroic. And as the book begins, Tarwater actually thinks that he betrays two parts of his life's mission as his uncle has set it for him. He is supposed to bury his uncle when he dies, and he's supposed to baptize the young retarded boy, Bishop. He thinks he has betrayed his life's mission. His uncle is not buried. He's burned. And Bishop lies beyond his reach. His uncle, if you think of it like this, his uncle has told Tarwater, look, you have two objectives in your life. When I die, bury me. And when I die, Make sure that that young boy gets the grace that he deserves as a child of God. And what does Tarwater do? He burns his uncle, he thinks, and he drowns the child. I don't want to spoil the ending, but the drowns the child, <coughs> that's a spoiler alert. Sorry. Forget that I said it if you don't want to know. So you'd think, I mean, just given what I said, your job is to do A and B, and he does not A and not B, you'd think that Tarwater would be the bad guy of the book, right? But I think that's not correct. I think the bad guy of the book, the, 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 the character for whom O'Connor has the most ire and contempt is Raber. The school teacher. And through her contempt for Raber, the school teacher, she intends to show <coughs> that the Christian represented by Old Man Tarwater and in part by Tarwater himself, is not American. The Christian is mysterious, difficult to understand, difficult to explain. In other words, old man Tarwater, this weird, strange character that dies at the beginning of the book, may look strange, but that's O'Connor's point. She seeks to show that a genuine Christian is strange, is a stranger in the world doesn't fit in. She wants to show, in other words, and to emphasize the parts of Christianity that do not easily fit in with the American character. The parts of Christianity that are not progressive, that are not optimistic in any conventional sense. Think of it like this, much like Cather, O'Connor thinks Christianity has been tamed by America, <coughs> has become integrated into normal American morality. What being Christian means is being nice, being punctual, minding other people's time not drinking too much, not allowing your hens to fornicate, not overly indulging in sensual activities, but making sure you have enough. 
What O'Connor wants to do <coughs> is paint a picture of Christianity that might not be so nice. She's going to emphasize judgment, God's judgment on the world, not niceness. She's not going to use the Easter Bunny as the representative of Christianity. She's going to use the cross, which is like, you know, less happy. So it's a very similar account of the relationship between America and Christianity to that you see in Cather, except what O'Connor is doing is presenting that alternative. Cather shows that there's a problem, <coughs> just as O'Connor would agree, but O'Connor is showing what a Christian life would be in this progressive country of America. And as I say, it's strange. It's foolishness, even. But that's what it is. So I think that's the overall thrust of the book. Christianity is not about being nice. It's about baptism. It's not about being nice. It's about judgment. It's not about the habits of healthy people. It's about preparing for death. So what I plan to do now is to go through these characters. I want to look at three characters today before we break up. Uh, Raber, Meeks, and Old Man Tarwater. The two crucial ones for our purposes are Raber and Meeks, of course, because they're the one, or Raber uh, and Meeks on the one hand, but I mean Raber and Old Man Tarwater, because they are the alternatives. They are the people battling over the soul of Tarwater himself. Now, as I mentioned, let's start with let's start with Raber, the character of Raber. Raber is the bad guy of the book. Can we all agree on that? The bad guy of the book. So he's the antagonist. He's the person on whom O'Connor spews scorn. But it's always crucial when you see people who are teachers in books, right? Raber is a teacher, meaning that he wants to educate the future citizens of America in his ways. He and his views are what people should learn. They should represent the future, the cutting edge of society's evolution. I know many of you probably don't read this stuff, but school teachers are important in many novels. I think um, uh, the most obvious one is Sinclair Lewis's Main Street, where the teachers are always the one who are trying to loosen up the town. It's like Footloose, the movie Footloose. Uh, the teachers are always the ones who say, hey, you guys want to learn how to dance? That way you can get over your puritanical zealotry, maybe get a taste for one another, and then maybe go in the back seat and get it on. <laughs> and today's teachers would make sure you would practice safely. Raber is the hope for the future. Okay? He wants to shape the future. He contributes research, even, on the cutting edge. He is America. Now, as I mentioned early in the introduction, Raber has been kidnapped before. He was kidnapped by old man Tarwater earlier in his life. I think it lasted about 10 days. He was rescued by his father, the insurance salesman. Old man Tarwater thought he was rescuing Raber from the miseducation that his father was going to give him. 
The reason he was kidnapping him was to save him from being overly integrated into America's ways. But nevertheless, his father gets him back and raises him to be a good American. Page 59, please. <clears throat> the, 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 the long paragraph that is there on page 59 for those with the favorite number. It was not to be wondered at. The old man would say that the school teacher was no better than he was with such a father as he had. The man, an insurance salesman, wore a straw hat on the side of his head and smoked a cigar, and when you told him his soul was in danger, he offered to sell you a policy against any contingency. He said he was a prophet too, a prophet of life insurance. For every right-thinking Christian, he said, knew that it was his Christian duty to protect his family and provide for them in the event of the unexpected. There was no use treating, him, uh, treating with him, the old man said. His brain was as slick as his eyeballs and the truth would no more soak into it than rain would penetrate tin. The school teacher, with tar water blood in him, at least had his father's strain diluted. Good blood flows in his veins, the old man said. The good blood knows the Lord, and there ain't a thing he can do about having it. There ain't a thing, there ain't a way in the world he can get rid of it. So he thinks he's ripe for the taking, but you see what kind of father he had. His father reduces everything to profit or to self-interest, rightly understood. Well, it's a Christian duty to buy life insurance. You've got to take care of your family. Doesn't that make some sense? Wouldn't that what American <coughs> Christians would say? To be a good, solid citizen, you should take care of your family. And it's to save him from that world, that old man Tarwater, out of, in other words, out of care for this young man's soul. Old man Tarwater has kidnapped him and tried to save him. For those 10 days out in the country, Raber was taught about judgment and the grace found in Jesus Christ. But then the father comes and steals him back, if I can say it like that, gets him back, and takes him to the real world, as he was told, not the fake world of old man Tarwater. And in the real world, Raber abandons the faith. Page 73. One second, this is the confrontation between... Raber and Old Man Tarwater. His uncle would ignore this and go on. He had thought for a while that by living with the school teacher, he might convince him again of all that he had convinced him of when he had kidnapped him as a child. He had had hope of it until the time when the school teacher showed him the study he had written of him for the magazine. Then the old man had realized at last that there was no hope of his doing anything for the school teacher. He had failed the school teacher's mother and he had failed the school teacher. And now there was nothing to do but to try to save Tarwater from being brought up by a fool. In this, he had not failed. Now let's try to be clear about what Raber stands for, okay? Because he has a certain vision of what education is. And hence, he has a certain vision of what a good human life is. The goal of education, according to Raber, is freedom. But 
What is freedom? I'm just going to intersperse some quotations from Raber on this matter. Freedom is being one's own savior. Page 70. Or straightening oneself out by one's own efforts. Page 76. Freedom is realizing that there's no savior but yourself. Page 76 again. Everything that human beings need for salvation lies within the will of every human being. If they would just cut loose the shackles that hold them back and grasp the opportunity. We have the ability to save ourselves through education, through proper application of science and study, through the remaking of our world. And it's people like old man Tarwater that are holding us back. And this is the ideal that Raber wants to educate Tarwater toward. You can be your savior. He says to him, page 92, you have a chance to develop into a useful man, a chance to use your talents to do what you want to do, and not what he, old man Tarwater, wanted, whatever idiocy it was, end quote. Now we're going to see that old man Tarwater has a much different conception of what freedom is, but I think it is not a stretch to say that Raber's understanding of freedom is your understanding of freedom, or at least you insofar as you are an American. And this is the crucial point, that understanding of freedom is hostile to Christianity. which says you cannot be your own savior. And Raber is consistent on this matter in a way that most American Christians aren't. Raber is not agnostic on the question of Christianity. He is antagonistic on the question of Christianity. In other words, he hates it. He sees it as a shackle. He sees it as holding mankind's progress back. And only if Raber had his own son to educate toward this ideal. But instead, he stuck with the idiot, Bishop. And Raber, of course, blames God, however foolish position this might be, blames God for the idiocy of Bishop. He raises the problem of evil. How could a loving God, the God that old man Tarwater describes, allow such an idiot to live? And of course, Raber, as I say, regards the boy as simply a useless idiot who would be better off dead. And he sees Tarwater, Raber sees Tarwater is his one chance to have a true son, someone who can genuinely be educated. Page 92, <laughs> right at the end of part one here. The last paragraph on 92, that's only, uh, ta uh, when, when Tarwater shows up on his front porch. This is what Raber has to say. That's only Bishop, he said. He's not all right. Don't mind him. All he can do is stare at you. And he's, and he's very friendly. 
He stares at everything that way. His hand tightened on the boy's shoulder and his mouth stretched painfully. All these things that I would do for him, if it were, if it were any use, I'll do for you, he said. Now do you see why I'm so glad to have you here? <laughs> I think we can develop, so, you know, Raber stands for the future, okay, progressive change, and the ability for human beings to construct our own world according to our will. We see another character briefly near the end of part one, who I think is also important for developing this American way of thinking, and that's the uh, copper flu salesman Meeks. We all have a little bit of Meeks in us. Meeks seems like a decent enough guy, right? He's a traveling salesman. He does good work. He's no doubt very nice to his customers. In fact, he loves his customers. He says it himself, page 51. <coughs> Love is the only policy that works 95% of the time. You can get people to buy more copper if you act like you love them. And this is American morality. This is self-interest rightly understood. I often get in arguments with my wife on precisely this topic, although I won't bore you with all the details. But when our kids lie or do something like that, my wife's reaction is often, what would happen if you get caught? Which is, you know, something to worry about. But that's not what's wrong with it. <laughs> you following me? And if they wouldn't get caught, would it still be wrong? Yes. It's not just about policy. Honesty is the best policy. You ever hear that statement? That's American morality summarized in one sentence. Is honesty good in itself? No, it's the best policy. Right? And over the long haul, maybe that's true. Is honesty a virtue, according to that statement? No. It's just the best way to get ahead. This is Meek's approach. So Meeks is uh, tar water burns down the, the house, burning down the house. That's where that song comes from. And it burns down the house, he goes to the highway and uh, gets picked up by Meeks, who's going to give him a ride into the city. Let's just take a look at a couple, um, couple of places where we get Meeks explaining to, uh, to tar water the ways of the world. Page 55. Right at the bottom, Meeks was telling him about the value of work. He said that it had been his personal experience that if you wanted to get ahead, you had to work. He said this was the law of life, and it was no way to get around it because it was inscribed in the human heart like love thy neighbor. He said these two laws were the team that worked together to make the world go round, and that any individual who wanted to be a success and win the pursuit of happiness, that was all he needed to know. You ever hear that from anyone? Work hard, dream big, <coughs> be nice to others, that's all you need to do. There's no sin in that story, and no redemption, except what you win. One more place, let's just turn uh, to page 78. This is my favorite line from the guy. Middle paragraph, right before he goes to see, uh, Meeks goes to see his prostitute slash girlfriend. Meeks leaned casually against the door of the car, driving with half his attention and giving the other half to tar water. Son, he said, I'm going to be a preacher to you. I'm not going to tell you a lie. I'm going to tell you nothing impossible. All I'm going to tell you is this. 
Don't lie when you don't have to. Else, when you do have to, nobody will believe you. You don't have to lie to me. I know exactly what you've done. Great advice for your children. Don't lie when you don't have to. Now, of course, Meeks is just another spin on Raber's view of life. He is committed to self-help as a basis for freedom. If you want to think of it like this, Raber is a liberal, Meeks is a conservative. Raber works for the state, Meeks is a small businessman. But they are both committed to self-help. Liberals believe we can build a great society. Conservatives will emphasize individual responsibility. But each believes that human beings save themselves. They only disagree about whether we need to do that individually or collectively. The teacher and the welfare woman, on the other hand, and the salesmen, on the other hand, are united in this fundamental commitment towards self-help, towards saving yourself. We make the world and all that is in it. We are responsible for our salvation. The way Raber understands Bishop and the way Meeks treats his prostitute girlfriend, they use each of them or see them as useless are central to their points of view. And as I say, I think that's O'Connor's view of America.